Welcome to Positive Filter with your host, Philip Wilkerson, a podcast that focuses on friends, family, health, and career with a little self-help along the way. Please join me in this journey for self-improvement, and I hope what I have to share will make you a better person, thus making the world a better place. I hope you enjoy the show. Hello, people of the world. It's Philip Wilkerson back with another episode of Positive Filter. As you know, I'm in the creative space. I met a lot of fellow podcasters on LinkedIn, and I had the good fortune of meeting my new guest right here on those platforms, fellow podcaster, listen to his show, which is amazing, which we're going to be touching upon. But uh, it's just a great space. You know, I think what you put out is what you get in. So obviously, for those that are building a personal brand, just keep on continuing to put yourself out there because you'll get connected digitally with such amazing people. And so that tells me into uh, this conversation today, with Mr. Justin Peters, uh, podcast host, has a podcast called The Struggle is Real, which we're going to be touching upon. But Justin, give the listeners a little bit of who you are. Well, thanks for having me on the, the show, man. I've been looking forward to this. I know we booked it out a couple of months ago. Um, but, but whenever I saw this was on the calendar for the week, I was super stoked. And I do love the power of podcasting as well, just for the simple fact that it brings you and I together in the sense that it, you know, we probably would have never ran into each other, um, if it wasn't for that. But, uh, what was the original question? You, you want to know a little bit about yeah, who so I am? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. So, so podcaster for four plus years, uh, have an original show called the struggle is real. Um, it's all about helping 20 somethings figure out this defining decade of their life. Uh, we have a heavy emphasis in personal finance right now, um, but we cover career topics, relationships, health and wellness, kind of all the things related to to being a 20 something and, and ste- stepping into quote, quote, adulthood. Um, so that's pretty much um, my passion project, my bread and butter, everything that I really love to do. And then I also run a podcast agency with my little brother, Kyle. I love it. See, and you know, it's funny, um, Justin, you know, I, you know, you see me out here. I actually work with young people. Uh, I work at a university. You can see it right here at George Mason University here in Fairfax, Virginia. And uh, I think your your target audience in my podcast are a lot of the students that are that I'm seeing. Um, talk about that. Like talk about the need to have a voice for that demographic. You know, I, I guess is this Gen Z or whatnot? Like what you know, the, when you were exploring creating a podcast, why was the the struggles and issues that you know, affect young people, 20 year olds was the topic you went with? Um, I think straight out of the gate, I, I always like learning from people that are one step ahead of me. So whenever I starting a podcast, really wanting to identify who I wanted to help, um, I was kind of thinking through that a little bit like, okay, I was just kind of out of my mid 20s, starting my late 20s. This is definitely a generation I can help. But but more importantly, I just realized how hard it was. Uh, you know, you, you kind of get fed this this empty bag of goods that like college is going to be this place, this four year education that's really got to set you up for success and and launch you into adulthood and, and kind of help you propel you to success. And in some aspects, college truly is that and it does help with a lot of things. But in other aspects, college doesn't prepare you for a whole lot of things that adulthood is going to throw your way. Personal finance relationships, the the health and wellness piece to it, all these topics that I really love to explore on the podcast, I feel like aren't explored enough at college. And I'm not even sure if it's college's job to do that. Um, so I wanted to fill the gap with the education and, and create the podcast for that reason. I love it. You know, and I'm thinking about this, right? Like I am a generation out of that. You know, I almost, I'm one year from the big 4 I know I look good. I know I don't look good. You do look good, man. I would never have guessed that. No, but two kids are burnt, you know. But (laughs) um, what are some issues that you see are disproportionately affecting young people as the target audience of your podcast, as opposed to one generation out, I believe that's my generation? What are some issues, like, as you were developing and having these conversations, like, and I I have a few things that I know disproportionately are affecting young people, but I want to hear from you first. Yeah, I would love to hear your thoughts as well. And I don't know if these are going to be disproportionate to 20 somethings versus late 30 somethings. Um, Of course, there's social media and the impact that has on confidence. Um, Another big one that I hear all of the time is around career pathing. And I just talked about this like empty bag of goods that college sells you and you start college and you pick a major 
and you're like, okay, cool. I want to be an accountant. So you, you pick, you're in the accounting school and that's your major. And then halfway through that, you know, your soft into your sophomore year, you're like, I don't, I don't think it's accounting. Maybe it's just business. I want to do business. Uh, you know, maybe it's business finance. I want to get a little bit broader. And you go through that, you graduate your, with your business finance degree. You, you finally land your first job and you're like, sweet, this is it. This is my career. Here we go. And what I find so many 20 somethings come to me with is I'm 25. I just did eight plus years between education and my early career and this career path that I thought was going to be my everything. And I realized I don't want to be involved in that career path whatsoever. I have no idea what I want to do, but I want to mix it up. I'm kind of having the, the quarter life crisis right now. And that's, I think that's a, a topic that almost every 20 something goes through. And I wish we were messaging college as the start of your career exploration, not the end of your career exploration. I think um, we get that wrong more times than not. You know, it's that your, your 20s should be for a ton of different exploration. You should be trying three or four different career paths, different jobs, tons of hobbies, side projects, different things so that you can figure out what really lights you up. And also, if you decide to change that in your 30s or 40s or 50s as well, that's okay. We're human. We're allowed to change our interests and our motivations at any point in time. I love it. Well, two things that resonate with me is one, you know, being on the cusp of 40. Uh, now that I see where I am in my life, my health and where I want to go, I definitely feel like I have a whole life to live. I'm like, wow, I'm almost starting another aspect. I can have a whole nother job. I'm going back to get my PhD. I might go in the realm of academia, right? Like, so I do totally agree that like in that mirror of 25 year old, you don't see that by the time you're 40, you still have a whole life to live. Like you have a lot of life to live, especially if you live in healthy and we can live to hundred, you know, I don't want to, but we could, <laughs> um, that's another topic. And then additionally, one of the things I wanted to bring up that I see is disproportionately affecting young people in their twenties is entering the economy and they're not af able to afford things like my generation was. Mm. So you're right. They get sold this dream that they're going to go to college and get a job. But then everything's so expensive. They're like, I got to pay for school. I got to pay my loans. And they can't even afford a house. Mm -hmm. Like, I've heard of so many young people that can't even um, afford home and bills. And, and I think that's this portion. Because when I graduate, I think I did graduate during a recession in 2008 from undergrad. Mm -hmm. But just understanding that, I don't know, I was able to get my first apartment. And it wasn't crazy in my mind. In my mind. And now I own a home. I own my home. I, I, I find so many challenging young professionals, young professionals are not able to afford things like they thought they could. You found that too. And I think that's where the personal finance piece really comes in. Dude, I, I see and hear that all of the time. And I, I thank my dad so much for instilling some, some strong personal finance principles in me at an early age. I, I was, I've always been saving and I've always been living below my means, which are two really important aspects to this. But I don't blame 20 somethings that just took on five, six figures of student loan debt, get launched into the real world. They're making 40, 50 K at a entry level salary job. Yeah. And they're looking at sticker prices for, for homes. And it's 300, $350,000. They ask what the mor mortgage payments got to be. It's like $2,500 a month. They want to buy a new car because they've been driving a beater all their life. And you know, there's another $800 a month too. It's very easy to get buried in this and oh yeah, student loans are restarting again. So you got to start paying on those as well. I, I do not envy where 20 somethings exiting college are at at this point point with with all the finances and all the burden that's coming here. I mean, education prices have score, uh, skyrocketed over the last 25 years. Home prices since the early, you know, 2000s in between 2008 have also been soaring. It's a really tough time. And then also we're getting the social pressure from older generations, from parents, from our grandparents like, "Hey, why aren't you settling down? Why aren't you getting a home? Why aren't you starting a family?" And yeah. and why don't I think you move out? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and granted, I I do think yeah. some of that is just, you know, changing societal norms, but another part of that is just it's super expensive right now. Mm -hmm. It's really hard, you know. I don't want to start a family when I have $100,000 in student loans and I'm living with my parents and I'm driving a 2006 Honda Civic and I'm not going to be able to afford bringing another person into this world and taking care of them as well. You know, one of the things I want to touch upon too is that you did speak about disproportionately the effect of social media on young people. Now, I do see this too. Uh, I see it with my kids, that's just, but I also see it with the generation that you're referring to is that 
there is more of a identity tied to social media than my age. Like yeah. we'll throw stuff up on Instagram. We don't care if we get likes or not. <laughs> like follow follow an old person on Facebook and they throw stuff on there. They don't care. They rock with it. They won't take it down. I remember I talked to this young person one time, one of my students, and they were like, this is, I don't know, maybe this is normal. This student told me if this post does not get the amount of likes in the first hour, they delete it. Yeah. And my generation was like, let it rock. You know, yeah. so like if you talk to that identity piece and the 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 diff, you know, what you've noticed that the struggle is real, the influence of social media on decision making and just, you know, maybe well being for themselves. I think you're on the pulse on this one. I, I truly do. I, I do think like when I hear a story like, hey, if I if it doesn't reach a certain amount of impressions or likes within the first hour, I delete it. And they might try to repost that later on or they might reflect and think, okay, people don't want to see myself talking about this story anymore. So then they go and fabricate a bigger story or go out and, and try to flex in a different way. And it's really challenging. It's a one-up game on social media. I do love social media for many different reasons. It's able to connect to someone like you and I together. We're allowed to to put people um, in our sphere that would, we would never be able to be uh, close to. But as much positivity as there is, there's that equal or even more compounding negative effect that it, it could have. And it's it's crippling to an extent. And I, I feel terrible and I don't know what to really do about it. But But yeah, I do think it's it's a glorified highlight reel for a lot of people. And, and it's easy to see why people can be depressed whenever they spend so much time on social media. So how were you and your brother able to weaponize the use of media, you know, creating a podcast, uh, really sharing your voice, connecting with people like me without it being a detriment to your well-being? Yeah, I, I, I like to think that we're putting out good, both inspirational and educational content out there and all of our clients that we work with as well. That's almost one of my very first predetermining factors if I want to work with someone or not. Like, do mm. do I believe in their content? Do mm. I think it's doing more good than, than harm? Um, so those are all things that I'm really thinking through, and I want to support and promote and 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 help um, creators that, that have good intention with all of this. Because once again, for each one of those bad stories I hear, I do also hear of the person that, um, you know, I was, I was just uh, watching a, a video um, yesterday, and this guy, he was overweight, 305 pounds. He got hooked on Goggins, uh, David Goggins. I'm guessing yeah. you know who David Goggins yeah, is. I'm, yeah. I'm guessing a no, lot you, of people. Yeah, 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 yeah. Stay yeah. hard. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think a lot of people knew who David Goggins is, and this guy's never even met David Goggins. But David Goggins, through social media, has inspired this guy to go from 305 pounds all the way down to 170 pounds. And this was like in the course of like four or five months. And this guy just got after it. And anytime he needed a little pick me up or a motivation, he'd flip over to David Goggins' page. He'd watch one of his videos. He would get inspired by this guy and he would go out there and he would go get it done. So I love the power and the impact that that has. Um, and I feel like through through some some filtering and making sure that I'm also doing the same, that that we can thread the line and, and go out there and, and make impactful, con um, impactful content without necessarily dumping into the negativity that what social media is. I love it. So, you know, I share, maybe you thought about this or, you know, what is that checklist? Because I think that's, something that could be applicable to not only me, but anyone like, what is that checklist to say, like the red flags of intention and making sure that, you know, particularly like you as someone that works with content creators, what is that checklist of intention to make sure like there's no red flags there? And what were, you know, some of your red flags when you're like, you know, I can't work with you because it set off my red flag. Yeah, I think if the content is trying to make someone feel good, in order to pull them closer or buy a product or provide a service, that's an immediate red flag for me. Like there's a way to approach, um, you know, David Goggins, for example, of inspiring someone to lose weight. And then there is a reason, and then there's another way to exasperate what being overweight is doing to yourself and your image. And in order to to be more confident and feel more confident, you need to lose weight. So here's my product for you. Like, I think it's easy to see it whenever you whenever you you can call it out. Um, so that's definitely one of my, my big red flags. What about you, man? I'm sure you have a couple Wait, of- So you said, you're saying more like the snake oil, yeah. you know, the snake oil, like my solution is the only solution and uh, like overall exaggerating. And it's like, what I'm hearing from you is like, you know, I want people to do well. We talk about stories of doing well. 
And then you're like, well, matter of fact, like, it's almost like you go at it through an act of service and then matter of, you get clients organically or get support organically or get inspired organically. But it's, you're right. It's not just shoving products down people's throats. Yeah. Um, it's, it's not, it's not scaring people or terrifying. Them. Them. Yeah, yeah that's exactly. One too. I, I, I don't like that. And, um, there is a place for tough love. Like I, I'm guessing working in education, you know, whenever you got to drop the hammer and you got to give someone some tough love and you got to be like, Hey man, like you got to step up. Like you know, we've had this conversation yeah. three times now, like at some point in time, you got to share the tough love. So it really sinks in with someone. Um, but there's other ways to inspire and encourage people before I think that happens. Well, I was also thinking about tough love too. I mean, uh, people are not going to receive tough love until you have a, a, a level of rapport or support. Yeah. So like, you can you'll take tough love from a coach after you buy into the system or Definitely. buy into the you know we're gonna win and win a championship and then when that coach is grabbing your helmet and cussing you out you're like all right bet but i'm this is my fearless leader but he's not gonna go day one you can't yes. do that you can't come in like that um you know buy in and you always see these movies right really hard leaders but it takes it it they're hard on you because they want to see you do better but they people bought in first right so that's one thing and I think one of my biggest red flags, right, was organically. This is the first time we met, um, but we had a conversation before. Um, I think I still have this, like, in, how is this person in real life if I had the opportunity to talk to them offline? Mm -hmm. And I've seen a lot of non-alignment of their digital brand to who they are as real people when I meet them. Mm -hmm. Then I was like, dang, that's crazy. I feel like I got catfished. And we think about this. People don't only get catfish in romantic relationships. They get catfish in business relationships or friendships. And so that's one of my big antennas is, is the authenticity of this person, you know, really there offline. And it could be offline, even like offline on an offline Zoom meeting, but not that, you know, LinkedIn post or whatever, but like just, or, you know, um, offline in a, um, a FaceTime. But when there's a one-on-one -on -one conversation, is this person aligned with what they're trying to project very publicly. Yeah. And I've seen some misalignment sometimes and it's crazy. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's nice. You know, I, I have a little bit more runway whenever we're working through prospects and I'm trying to identify if we're a good fit for them. We've had multiple conversations. I'm usually getting introduced uh, to them through someone else or they might've introduced me and the best um, medicine for me to really decide if, if somebody is, is a good person or not, is what do, what do other people say about them? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, do they go to bat for them? Like more times than not, if it's a really good person, I'll mention someone's name and like, dude, that guy's such a good dude, man. Like I, I like he did this, he did that, or, or like, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. she, she stepped up whenever I really needed it. Like people will go out, out of their way and say really good things about you whenever you're not in the room. If, if you're a good person. I mean, I think that's one of my, we, I did a presentation about, uh, one of my red flags for mentorship. You know, when I reach out to someone that I view as a leader, I do exactly what you said is what did the people that work with that person day to day say to that person? Because while I may want that, you know, that person may be the top dog at their institution and have all these titles visibly. If I talk to someone and say, Hey, you know, how is it working for X, Y, and Z person? And they're like, this person is terrible as a leader. They, they do this. I don't care how established or how credentialed you are. I don't want to be your mentee or protege. Like that is not one that I want to model. So I definitely adhere to it. Anyone, you know, I mean, I'm not saying you should always have red flags up, but I think that is a good technique for vouching is what are the recommendations of the immediate people? And also what are the recommendations of people that have nothing to gain by hyping that person? Exactly. Meaning like, you know, like if I say just as my man and I'm not working on commission or anything, this is just authentically what I think. It's a non-biased opinion. I take that very seriously as opposed to, um, you know, Justin is a great guy. And if you go to him, here's my coupon code. You know, <laughs> my link. And you're like, oh, there's a, there's a little bit of agenda there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny, what, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you see it. Because I always say this too. Uh, when I tell students, young people, um, when they're looking at grad school, I say, and this is a good question to think about. When you're going to grad school, right? Who should you reach out to about grad school? I'm guessing people that are in grad school or recently graduated from grad 100%, school. 100%. Because if I go to the admissions folks, they're going to say, this is the greatest university 
ever. Yeah. If I go to the professors, they're gonna be like, this is the greatest thing. They're trying to sell you. Yeah. But if you go to a student that has no agenda, they got they just got through the program and they say, yeah, this program was really hard, but I love it. I vouch for it. So I always say, when I tell students to research institutions, yeah, look up the rankings and all that, but look up on look up recent alum on LinkedIn and mm -hmm. say, can I have an informational interview with you about your experience at this particular grad school? Because they're going to be the best voice, least biased voice, as opposed to like, you know, reach. Yeah, like I even tell people like, don't ask me about Mason. Ask the students, you know, yeah. so like, because you know that. So. And, and it's it's somewhat about quality of questions too. There there are yeah. going to be some quality questions that I can ask you as a representative of Mason um, that you're going to be able to give me a straightforward answer on. Like uh, it could be you know class availability or the um, uh, uh, student resources that are on campus. There there might be some more tactical questions that you're going to be the right person to ask for. But in terms of some other quality questions, you know maybe you want to ask a recent alum. You know, how, how has student services supported you post-graduation or, you know, how did you, did you feel like your professors made time and time for you, uh, out of, out of office hours? Like you gotta, you're the one that's responsible for the quality of questions and then identifying the right person to ask those questions to. I love three, 360 interviews. Like I'm going to talk to the admissions board. I'm going to talk to some professors and I'm going to put a lot of weight into current current students and future or graduated students and i'm going to ask them all different questions the one the questions that i think they're qualified to, to answer i love it so one of the things you know as we get you know this is going to be a little bit of a, a condensed episode because we know we're both very busy but one of the <laughs> things i want to you know as you poured into others and and created this content you know particularly this the struggle is real podcast what has been the unexpected benefits that is given to you by being a content creator and being consistent with, you know, creating this podcast and platform for young 20, 20 year olds. Or, yeah. Just a personal benefit for me has been the people that I've met through this pro project. Like I, it's a built in networking plan. I, I'm, I'm a pro fan of, of starting a podcast for anyone, because especially if you're going to do an interview based show, you're out there all the time, meeting potential guests, having conversations with guests, meeting other podcasters to collaborate with. It's a really cool opportunity uh, and kind of a forced opportunity for you to go out and do a lot of intentional networking. And then on the flip side too, it warms my heart anytime I get an email or a DM from someone that listened to an episode and they're just like, dude, I needed that piece of advice or man, I was really struggling with this and and I loved that episode that you covered. So it, it really fills my cup in, in kind of both of those avenues. That's funny. I was about to say, that's one of the unexpected benefits of a positive filter as like I, I've turned it into an archive of great conversations that I've even I used to hate, I mean, hate my voice, but now I listen to my old conversations because it's like so many wisdom, you know? So, and that wisdom of me, honestly, wisdom of my guests. I, I feel like I've had this archive of different topics that things I've always wanted to ask and learn about from different people. And as you said, uh, it's a great business networking tool because I've met a lot of people that wouldn't probably give me their time of day, but if I attach, hey, I'd like to interview you. Yep. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I love it. So. <laughs> And so this is a part of the show called Shot for Shot. I get to ask you any random question uh, or you get to ask me any random question. Uh, you want to go first, so I go first. Uh, I'll let you go first. All right. So, I mean, New Year's resolution, you know, I mean, let me rephrase. This is a two-parter. It's 2024. Do you believe in New Year's resolutions? And if so, what is it? And if you don't, how do you feel about the beginning of New Year's? I'm a big New Year's resolution guy. Uh, I'm a proponent of New Year's resolutions. I, I understand that it's silly that we wait until this arbitrary day to you know jumpstart all the things that we've wanted to do. But on the flip side, if I take that from an optimist standpoint, this is a great time, You know, the first of the year is a great time to stop, reflect, think about some of the things you wanted to be prioritizing and now get realigned and making sure you do prioritize those in the new year. So I'm a big fan of New Year's uh, resolutions for that reason. Um, one of my big ones this year is 
uh, to continue to grow our business so that my brother can f be full time in it. Uh, it's been um, a big passion of mine. We were pretty much there last year and I want to continue to grow it for him. It's been so cool. He took a sabbatical. We started a business together and he hasn't had to go back to work since then. Uh, I want to secure it this year. And, and that's definitely a top of priority for me. I love it. I love it. Now, what's your question for me? <laughs> um, we've been talking a lot about people who have had a positive impact on you. Who's one person, uh, maybe through social media, but someone that you've never met before that's less, that's made a huge impression on you? Like my David Goggins. Yeah, you're David you're Goggins. Not, I can say David Goggins, but um, oh man, there's so many people. I want to get his name right. Okay, so this is recent. So I, I'm just going to do top of mind. And I actually just posted about him on my IG story. So I want to make sure I get his name correct. <laughs> um, okay, here we go. Jordan Pierre, uh, frat brother, Jordan Pierre. I connected with him after I heard him talk. And I'm going to send it to him. And this is funny. This is a young man. I'm 39 years old. I think this young man is like 22. Mm. He did a keynote speech at, um, he was a keynote speaker at Syracuse University. Went viral. So type in Jordan Pierre. Syracuse, it'll be the first person that pops up. And he's a young person, but the way that he speaks, he speaks like he's older than me. Um, and I just literally just said it this morning. Um, I just reached out to him because like I said, I got the, he's the same frat as me. And so that's the uh, that's what uh, the, the beauty of Alpha Phi Alpha is, is I could just reach out to any brother and say, hey, brother Pierre, I love what you're doing. He says, thanks frat. And that's it. I mean, we got a connection. <laughs> but um, I've been watching him for far from that video that went viral about keynotes and then he actually does instagram post where he's kind of like david goggins where he's like for just putting it out there he's just not selling nothing he's just giving motivation of the day mm. like always on instagram and so i'm like we're gonna meet though the funny thing about that is just the world of alpha is so small that i'll probably meet this front brother someday i don't know yeah. how maybe at a national convention or something our paths will cross through that but I have not met this brother at all. And uh, he he has recently inspired me a lot. So that's my answer for today. Dope. There's a lot watch. of other people, but that I'll, one I'll is- I'll watch really, the video after this. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds sick. Yeah, I mean, it's a really good um, speech. And then he has a really good, um, uh, what's it called it? There you go. Uh, here, I'll put it in the chat after this conversation's over. So I found it. All right, well, this is that part of the show. It's called Shout Outs and Plugs. Uh, you get to show love and uh, to anyone you want to show love to and then plug anything that you want the listeners to be aware of. Um, like like your brother's bit, you and your brother's business. These are things I'll put in the show notes. So shout outs and plugs. Uh, the floor is yours. Cool. Um, one shout out I'd love to give is is one of our, our clients right now. I think he's creating a lot of really cool content. Uh, Jesse Kramer over at The Best Interest. Um, so if you're looking to break down complex financial topics into simple terms, this guy's crushing it, man. Uh, he doesn't get enough respect uh, for for the content that he creates. Uh, he's also got a really cool blog that's out there, um, thebestinterest.blog. And then uh, plugging, uh, of course, we'd, I, we'd love it if you came over to The Struggle is Real and uh, listened to an episode. So The Struggle is Real with Justin Peters. It's me with a coffee cup on the, the cover art. I love it. I love it. I'll put all that in the show notes, of course. Well, thank you, Justin. It's been a great episode. Uh, positive filter listeners thank you for listening to this episode please share it with a family member or a friend as you know every episode is dedicated to the memory of my late father-in-law jeff kirsch and so please consider donating to the jeff kirsch anti-hunger fund to support him uh, this is just a random shout out to but you know if you're ever at uva and you see a bench at the soccer field please take a picture with it and send it to me for the kicking it with jeff hashtag just to honor him that's one of my things for this year and also if you're a member of the mason nation please consider sending a patch for Patriots. It's a little e-form celebrating kindness. I'm, I'm going to start plugging that in every episode, <laughs> but um, please share this episode with a family and friends. Please uh, connect with Justin, engage with his content and his platform and support all the endeavors. If you're a young person that's interested in starting a podcast, honestly, go reach out to Justin because uh, as he said earlier, for a lot of young people, I've helped start podcasts, connect with him because it is also a great way to build confidence, build social capital, and meet new people. It's not always about making money, or monetizing a podcast. It could just be a great way to enhance your skills and get yourself out there. But this has been a great episode. Thank you for listening, and we're out. 
Thank you for listening to Positive Filter, a podcast that focuses on family, friends, career, with a little self-help along the way. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it with your family and friends and like the Facebook page, Spreading Positivity of Movement. Thanks for listening.